a uh, very good turnout for this um, seminar this evening. So it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Michael Fitchman. He is a lecturer here in the Department of City and Regional Planning. He was formerly the interim director of the Master of Urban Spatial Analytics program um, at the Weizmann School of Design. He is a city planner and he practices and researches in a variety of fields. He is an international leader in policy, research, and advocacy, advocacy uh, related to nighttime cities and nightlife arts and culture. Uh, this is a practice based on his 20 years in the music industry as a DJ, producer, composer, and label executive. He is an editor and author of the Global Nighttime Recovery Plan, an influential multinational effort to support nighttime industries through the pandemic. He is also a member of the Philadelphia City Council's Art and Culture Task Force. So without further ado, I present to you Michael Fitchman. Thank you. Hi. Can anybody, everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, there are no windows in here, so it might as well be like half you are in my class anyway. It might as well be, we'll just stay here until 10.15 tomorrow morning and then we'll just keep on with what we're doing. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, I am excited to talk about some of this work, which is something that a lot of people um, here in the department ask about, but is not something that I've, I've ever really talked about outside of just working with um, selected students and faculty members on some of, some of these projects. So it's exciting to be able to explain it more, more fully, and I'm also really excited to showcase a lot of the, the work that um, a lot of your student colleagues, either now or before you, have participated in, um, and I hopefully explain uh, something about work that otherwise seems sort of like idiosyncratic, or I wouldn't say mysterious, but what I really hope that you get from this is um, not so much like an ordered list of uh, the most important principles and how a nighttime city works and you know, organize, like, uh, information organized uh, in some way to just try to like give you everything about some topic that may be new to you. But um, I thought I'd do this a little more in the spirit of like our get to know lectures that we've been doing with Musa faculty the last couple years and try to like talk about it um, from a narrative standpoint. So I'm gonna start like eight years ago, well, a little longer than that. Start earlier on and then come to beginning this work about eight years ago and talk through a couple different projects. And hopefully along the way, um, all the themes will pop up at various points and we can touch on them when they do, when they do come up. Um, so uh, by the way, uh, I want to thank uh, Shinje, who um, is one of our MUSA students for this awesome flyer, which is a composite of an image from the Global Nighttime Recovery Plan taken by my colleague uh, Carlos Pardo and some maps from uh, our Creative Footprint project in Japan. You can like see they're all blended together. It's a great graphic, so thank you, Shinjay. Um, okay, so um, I want to hopefully um, touch upon a couple different issues and then also some skills, because for me, a lot of this is maybe um, a template for how you can think about what it is that you love to do and find the way that you can take your skills and apply them to a specific issue, a community, something like that, and make things better. And um, I think I, I want to try to tell you something about the nighttime city. How's this? Uh, oh, I got it. The nighttime city. What is it about cities at night that makes them maybe different from cities in the day? And some of the planning and policy themes that come with that including the idea of nighttime governance. Uh, some of you might have heard the term of a night mayor. Philadelphia recently hired our first night mayor. And um, we can talk about what the idea of nighttime governance is and where that comes from. And we'll talk a little bit about it in Philadelphia. Um, talk about nighttime communities and creative spaces, spaces for artistic production. Um, and I want to talk about what I, what I call four-dimensional 
planning, right? So it's not just um, you know a building going up in space that has an x coordinate and a y coordinate. It's it's moving through time over the course of a day, and why time is so important to understanding the city and how it works um, at night and what that how it sort of manifests itself in the data that we look at. Um, and the last theme I want to get to in terms of issues is it's not about the money. And I'll just leave that lie, but that, that, will, that will come up. Um, and then for those of you who are students, I thought that maybe it'd be cool to think about some of the skills that come into this work. Um, and for me, a lot of this was about figuring out the tools that I had in my toolkit that I could use to apply to a certain problem or certain issue or with, with certain community, that community happening to be like my own community. Um, but part of that is the, the, the skill of the planner as a translator, like the planner as a technology, a translation machine. Um, I talked about four-dimensional planning. We'll talk about time-space data and how important that is to understanding how a city changes from one time of the day to another. Um, we'll talk about data science, doing data science with communities. We'll talk about being prepared to meet opportunities when they come up and they, they arise, right? Being like fit in the gym to like do your skills. And um, these two things, I'll let them lay a little bit, but I'm gonna talk about what I call secret ninja skills and knowing something about something, okay? Um, so all right, that's, these things will all pop up, but I'm not gonna tell you about just some whole ordered list of, of uh, philosophies or themes or places or programs or anything like that. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Um, thank you to David Byrne. You may ask yourself, how did I get here? All right, so this, we're gonna get in a time machine and we'll start like uh, maybe like 20 years ago and we'll try to come up come up to the present through a series of like different um, experiences I had, different kind of like awakenings, aha moments, projects, places, things like that. Um, and maybe you can see your own story um, in some way uh, through this, this journey. So before, most of these pictures will be pictures of me before any of you met me. So for like, since I was like 16 years old, I've been producing music and DJing music in, in clubs. First time I played in a club, I was not old enough. I got snuck, snuck into a club to, to DJ. And so um, this was my job, my only job for a long time. And that job was really about like rubbing two pennies together and making it into a nickel. You know, and it involved a lot of really, really fun stuff. Um, but it was also, you know, sort of in the end, uh, I felt like, you know, I was like a double A ball player and like people that I knew from around town, like this guy, like they made the major leagues, right? But like, you know, at some point you think like, is there more? Am I ever going to get there? Like what's next? Um, but anyway, this is something that I've done since I was really young. And, um, even when I was, a kid, so my high school, like Wiz Khalifa, Mac Miller came from my high school. I remember going to, I couldn't get into a bar or a club, but I remember going to like a rave at the Irish Center in the woods, right? And I didn't stop and think for a moment, like there's a lot about informality and the, the creative space where this is going on that's like uh, uh, allowing this to happen for me to have these formative experiences. But it was great, I got to travel all over the world, I, I think, I, I stopped counting at some point, but I think I've played in, in like 45 markets in six countries um, and continue to do so. It's something I love to do. And so in the process of doing this, you go a lot of places and you end up in a lot of different situations and scenes and whatever. And one of those scenes, and I, I was, this is in Louisville, Kentucky in 2008 or nine. And I was just DJing in Louisville this past summer, reminiscing, actually, I met some, the two of the same people I was having this conversation with, I met them this summer, and we were reminiscing about it. So this is 6th and York, 5th and York, which is like west of downtown. And it's kind of this industrial area, if you know. Uh, Louisville, it's all these like old, like tobacco kind of warehouses and things. And I don't know where the building was, I don't remember this that well. I remember being inside, but maybe it was somewhere over here. But it's like 
4 in the morning. You see this thing says it goes 11 to 5. 4 in the morning. And I turned to the guy next to me. I said, when the police show up, am I going to get paid? And they're running a bar. We're in a warehouse. And, I, and he said, what do you mean? I said, this is clearly not legal. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But when the police show up, am I going to get paid if the police show up? And he said, no, everything is, this is all copacetic. Um, we, have a, we have an insurance policy. We have a fire plan. We have a this. We have a that. And I was like, how is this possible? We can't do this in Philadelphia. This makes a lot of sense. You don't want to run a venue all the time, but you want to do five or six events in a year. That's all you have the capacity to do. It's kind of flexible. You want to do stuff with the music that you like. And um, he was like, this is, it had something to do with the history of legalization of speakeasies around the Kentucky Derby, where they just wanted to kind of bring this stuff out of a gray area. And then I started noticing more things like this as I would go around. Like, why can they do this in Louisville but can't do it in Philly? Why do the trains run all night in Berlin? Why is it so easy to get on and off them without these transfers? It makes it really easy to get to and from the gig. Like, why is it that when I get out of the club DJing in New York at 4 a.m., the cabs are on a their cabs are on a change, and you can't get a cab? And why is it that all these venues are closing all the time? Why is it that there are formal venues and informal venues? How, like, and why are they where they are? And you know, I didn't think too much of it, but I started to notice. Notice the ways that the city touched the places where I was and where I was doing what I was doing. So let's like maybe think about, it, it's useful to think about this like exercise where I'm one of the people in the city at night. That's where I'm working. Um, so for me, I'm this first person. So let, the way I'm seeing the city is at nighttime is that like I need to get to and from where I'm going. I don't take public transportation because I'm going to walk out of there with like a couple hundred dollars in cash. I'm not walking around in Philly at 3 in the morning with all the cash. Um, so I'm choosing my housing based on the fact that like maybe I can have a car here somewhere. Um, I don't really have health insurance that often. Um, I need something to eat at a certain time of night, etc. cetera, right? Um, I'm not you know, up until a certain point in time, I'm not paying my taxes. I'm not reporting this income to anybody. I'm sort of in an informal area. Um, and that's what I'm doing economically and how I'm traveling from place to place um, and what I need. Uh, let's say you're a nurse who needs to ride public transportation to get to work. We're probably passing like ships, ships in the night, right? Um, but this person is waiting at a bus stop. This person is trying to walk from that bus stop to their house. Is there lighting to get them down the street to where they need to go? I tried to go just last night. Um, I was exercising, and then I went to get some groceries. Every gro I went to three grocery stores before I could find them what was open at 10.30, just, just last night. So this person, how do they get healthy food, right? What about uh, a woman who's going out to, con to have a night downtown? Is downtown designed to be safe for this person? I promise you, if you are um, a man, if you have not asked a woman, what are the things that run through your mind when you're preparing to go out downtown? And how do you think about like what you're gonna, what kind of bags you're gonna pack? There's so many different kinds of safety and precarity issues that I it never occurred to me until people told me about that. Who's designing that downtown for that person? right, and what they're doing. Um, let's say I'm an entrepreneur who produces events, all right? Like, am I on the books? Can I find the space I need? Who works for me? Um, do I, like, uh, do I, say, have um, venues that I'm working with all the time? Do I want to start my own venue? Am I looking to move to New York because I just can't make it happen here in Philly? Um, and lastly, and this maybe is the most dominant person, actually, I'm sort of leaving them till the end, but the most dominant person in this conversation in the city is like, what if you're a resident who lives in 
a mixed use neighborhood, which is most neighborhoods in Philadelphia, and you have a job during the daytime, you have a family, and all this other stuff is like kind of invisible to you. Um, and uh, I, there's a vignette, a friend of mine, Joanne, who's in, in here, we were having a drink a couple months ago with a friend of hers, and he said, you know what everybody who stands outside the bar um, across the street from me has in common? I said, he said, two things. They all smoke and they're all awake. <laughs> and this person might not like any of this other stuff that's going on, but they may like intuitively understand that you would like to have all these other people making all the great culture, providing the healthcare, doing whatever else it is to make the city an awesome place to be. So like, how does this stuff coexist or not coexist? How, how do these different groups function in the same place? <coughs> Excuse me. And like, what do we actually really even know about these people? And the answer I came to find was not much. <coughs> so I started thinking a little more about this stuff and just noticing more things. My eyes felt a little more open. Um, and I started writing about some of these issues. I was writing for Vice Magazine at the time. I wrote a story about um, basically vice squads in Capitol Hill uh, in Seattle and how they were trying to shut down certain venues. I wrote um, an article mainly based on personal animus about how Canadian immigration policy was locking out artists. But I started to think about policy and how it touches these kinds of things. And then I saw, something, I saw this stuff happen in my own backyard. So I think this was 2013, 14, or here's this 2016. There were a series of bills. This was in 2016. There were a series of bills um, that came through Philadelphia City Council, which were all kind of bizarre and like reactionary. Like somebody would get in a fight outside of a concert venue in somebody's district, and someone would complain to the council member, and then that council member would say, like, well, we're just going to try to make every venue report all the addresses and phone numbers of everyone who's going to play there to the police three months ahead of time. Which, regardless of what it says about us as like, you know, sort of a society of free expression, it was just kind of born out of mis reactionary thinking and misunderstanding, because that, that would never be practical. Impractical, I, I think, hopefully that's my quote, but it's very impractical to ask anyone to do that. Seldomly do you get this information in this informal setting, but much less three months. That why would you give it to the police? Um, and this kept happening. So after this particular <laughs> instance, uh, my friend Cosmo Baker and I got on the phone and we're like, why do we have to like, circle the wagon, scramble the jets, whatever you want to call it, every time this happens? Because this keeps happening. And why isn't, and, and we can organize ourselves pretty well because it turns out it's not a smart idea to, to piss off people who have like 30,000 per person email lists, all of them, right? And you can get a lot of people uh, on message pretty fast if you piss off every concert promoter in Philadelphia so you know how to contact everybody. Um, but like, how do we keep this from happening? This is repetitive, and what it really says is that people don't understand how this works at all. They don't understand the nuts and bolts of these industries. They don't understand how, how things function. Um, but they all seem to place a value on it. Um, and they all think it's what, what makes Philadelphia a charismatic and great place to live. So what's to be done? Um, there, Philadelphia's not unique um, in having these issues. Um, and when you start to look at some of the specific issue areas, they happen in many different cities. Um, and there are different policy prescriptions that different places come up with. Some people do nothing at all. Some people do a lot. Here are a few examples. Um, on the top left, uh, some of you may remember um, the ghost ship fire in Oakland, California, an informal space that, that had a fire, actually um, killed somebody that I grew up with. Um, very serious 
major issue regarding informal spaces, health code, and fire code, right? Um, what are the ramifications for how uh, spaces are policed, permitted, et cetera, um, or how people decide to self-police in their own communities for safety? Um, really common, you know, real estate pressure issues everywhere uh, causing or being thought of as causing <coughs> So, like art spaces to go out of business. At, you know, in many ways, this is not a deeply researched dynamic, but it's sort of a truism that people understand. Um, the UK was having like, you know, I, I think it was like 25% attrition in grassroots music venues. They were starting to attend to this uh, on a national policy level. Um, and then some productive ideas. Here's an idea from Berlin Club Commission, who is an organization that shows up later here um, for major soundproofing funds, so, you know, as a proactive barrier between neighbors and, um, and venues to protect them, um, and harm reduction ideas like uh, bystander training. There are lots of examples of this around the country and the world. Um, one idea that's very charismatic that I noticed right away is this idea of a nightmare. And at the time, there were only like, I don't know, maybe a dozen. Um, but um, I wanted to know more. So I, I'm getting a little out of order here, but I went and chased some of these people down and met with them because I was interested in this. So Mirik Milan, the night mayor of Amsterdam, which is the first, I mean, that's sort of a quasi-governmental position, but he's the first one inside government, um, who's actually now one of my partners on a lot of things, he'll show up later here. I went and chased him down in New York. He was going to New York to consult with people who wanted to repeal the cabaret law, which for those of you who don't recall this, the cabaret law in New York and something that they had in Japan called the Fuejo Code, which were basically no dancing rules. So it was technically illegal to dance in New York unless you had like one of uh, several tens or dozens of these specific licenses that no one actually held, they were very rare. But what it really was is it meant that the police could raid and shut down anywhere at any time. Cabaret law, this goes back to things like, you know, this shows up in stories like Stonewall. It was basically a, so, you know, a social control mechanism in some ways that wasn't used very much, but is a vestige of that time. He was there in New York. I sort of chased him down and um, talked to him and learned a little bit from him. I visited the night mayor's office in the city of London. Um, and uh, so I got to know some of these, these ideas. And then we'll see in some of the, the work that I'm going to talk about now that we've kind of framed this, these things um, are, some of these are very evergreen concepts. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about the nature of the nighttime city and what it's like for people moving in and out of it. I don't have very many of these like long lists of things. but. The city at night seems a little different than the city during the day, primarily because of that last person we talked about when we like, walked through this list of people, which is the person who sleeps at night, right? So you, during the day, I mean, people don't like it if you're creating a lot of noise pollution or light pollution or something like that. But that stuff is generally um, accepted because human beings are um, diurnal creatures and daytime is when we do stuff and we can all accept that maybe you can make some noise during the day. So most laws and services are built around the nine to five. And they but most services require scale to function well. One of the reasons you don't necessarily run the subway all night is because who's riding it? Like you have to pay all the people to run the subway and police to be in the and token takers and whatever else. If there aren't any, if no one's riding it, you're not going to run it. So that's one problem. A lot of things require scale to be um, functional. Second, and this is really important, nighttime has negative social associations going back to prehistory. Like dark, before the advent of artificial light, is a scary thing. And People gravitate towards artificial light, congregate in groups. Deviance, criminality, vice, um, fairy tales, 
animals in the forest. Like, think about light and dark. It wasn't until Star Wars that we, like, switched around light and dark as, like, shibboleths of good and evil. I mean, I don't know if that's true. I'm not a historian. But you know what I'm saying. Generally speaking, there's the light and the dark. And, and, and this is very much ingrained in who we are biologically. Um, but as part of an offshoot of that, the people who have been banished to the nighttime, um, after artificial light came around, a lot of people embraced the nighttime. And there, you can be yourself. You can be somewhere, somewhere, somebody different. You can be with your community that you can't be with when you're working with in the day. You have your leisure time because the day has been extended with artificial lighting. So certain communities meet and commune at night, and certain arts and culture and social situations only really happen at night. Um, and that's special. And that's like kind of what draws a lot of people to, this, to these issues. Um, but many of these communities and jobs don't have social status. They're unseen. And they're actually unseen in terms of being stigmatized. They're literally unseen, like you don't see that third shift worker. Um, or they're sort of unseen in terms of like data, right? Like they're not on paper. Um, <clears throat> Nighttime needs artificial light to become the day that I mentioned. <coughs> and because people sleep at night, and that's the dominant culture, we have a culture of no when it comes to nighttime stuff. It's just easier to say, let's not deal with it than let's engage this in a productive way. So we have a prohibition-oriented attitude towards nighttime stuff. There's a problem, make it go away. We'll talk a little bit later about South Street. There was a shooting on South Street during the summer. And the answer was basically, flood the zone with police officers, make it so nobody wants to go there, bury this, and make this problem go away. It, you know, and that's tip, very typical. OK, so back on the timeline. Um, I asked um, Mirk Milan, the nightmare of Amsterdam, and my friend Rich Medina, to write me letters to build a community group. Remember, we were going to stop this from ever happening again. And that group became 24 Hour Philadelphia, which um, was support. Like, we got great seed money from 880 cities and, and the Knight Foundation, a very small grant to get our like graphic design and things like that. Pen Praxis uh, helped support us with some events and putting get together some materials. And what we did, we were. It, we're we're kind of dormant now. We got the, the pandemic and a number of other things have kind of uh, slowed the organization down. Um, but we're an informational resource and community engagement group. So we weren't, we aren't like, you know, advocating policy positions like a lobby. But we were trying to facilitate connections with, with experts, um, creating communication, dialogue, informational resources and research and things like that. And I'll show you some of our projects. So um, this is uh, actually, this is Lutz Leisenring. This is um, one of my partners in a lot of my projects. I got to meet him through some of this stuff. And he's the spokesman for the Berlin Club Commission. So this is, we brought Lutz to Philadelphia to tell us what they were doing there and you know try to maybe provide some inspiration. So this is, oh boy, like 2019 maybe. This is a, an event that we put on where we talked about a bunch of the different projects that we had going on. So, um, and these basically represent some of our teams. We had like a team-oriented approach where if there was an issue you were interested in, then you could participate in that and things kind of working independently. So accountable spaces, this is like, um, helping and auditing um, uh, creative spaces in Philadelphia for accessibility, um, having signage about consent policies, having good practices like uh, good view sheds for safety staff, whether the safety staff are trained in certain kinds of bystander intervention. We were working with um, Women Organized Against Rape Philadelphia on a lot of trainings. Um, Staying Alive, this is our partnership with the Philadelphia Department of Public Health doing drug, um, uh, drug like basically drug user awareness support. 
Um, so Narcan trainings and distributions for venues in Philadelphia and kind of like a, like a team, Michael and, and Allison, giving out supplies to venues across the city. Uh, the venue toolkit, this is Lily Goodspeech, who I think is a student at SB2 or Fells now, or was for a little bit. Um, this is uh, basically a how-to starter guide for how you navigate the approvals process to build, make a venue in Philadelphia, which is very confusing. Um, and then uh, Rich was, uh, you know, sort of giving the like, Rich and I gave the sandwich of sort of like, why are we here? What are, what are we doing here? What's the meaning of all this? Um, so we had a bunch of what I would consider to be successful um, campaigns or events. This is one where the Department of Licenses and Inspections said that they were going to fine concert venues. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but it was thousands of dollars for posters that were on the street. And we uh, got a back channel into L&I and, and, and their litter, anti-litter campaign. And we said, wait, can we talk about this? Because this is, you could like fine a small venue once for a promoter hired a band and they put up a poster and they're going to get fined basically their whole margin for a month. You could like, you could find somebody twice and put them out of business and they have, don't have a lot of control over this. And so this ended up being a great conversation and we were able to change their they changed their policy and they said, we're going to focus on like more predatory kinds of signage, like we pay cash for diabetic test strips and houses and things where they're really trying to separate, um, separate people from uh, their stuff rather than mess with a fragile uh, performing industry. Um, and then that, that ended up being a great bridge to L&I for working with them. They got this venue toolkit. They helped us vet it. Um, one other project we did, and I won't dwell on this because it comes back a little later, is that we surveyed the community. And this ended up being really important when COVID came around because then we could say, and this is a planner, this is a planner thing, right? This is like, I turned, if any of you have taken MUSA 508, we're like, all right, do this really complicated thing and make a one pager. And the reason you make a one pager is because this actually ends up on a politician, politician's desk at some point. And they, you can give them like six sentences, eight sentences, that's the max you've got, but you gotta make it count. But everything that went behind this um, was a lot of surveying, hundreds of surveys, you know, R code, and charts, and maps, and so on. So I'd mentioned uh, Mirik Milan and Lutz, they both showed up before. So I went to New York at some point with some members of 24 Hour Philadelphia, and Lutz was up there. Lutz and Mirik both, I don't remember. Anyway, they were in New York, and um, I just wanted to introduce people from Philly to them so that they would feel sort of inspired by what other things are possible. So, so Mirik is the night mayor of Amsterdam, the first and sort of most, uh, most well known. Lutz is the spokesman for the Berlin Club Commission, which is like the most powerful um, lobby of, of clubs in any city, really. Um, and we go up to New York, and we're talking about all kinds of other things. And they say, hey, by the way, we're here in New York because we're going to do this study where we find every venue, and we get like 100 people together, and we ask them tons of questions about all the different things about the programming in those venues and how old they are and whatever. And at the end, we give them a score. And we say, New York is a seven, and Berlin is an eight. And I said, that's interesting in the sense that you're leveraging your professional expertise, but like, there, that's a lot of data. and You might be able to do a lot more with that. And so that was the first of what became many projects that I've worked on together with this group. Um, so Vibe Lab, that's their group, <coughs> and Pen Praxis at Weitzman. Um, we've worked on, I mean, this is not an all-inclusive list at this point. But um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about this first one, the creative footprint. And I'll talk about all three of these. Um, and uh, you'll start to see the way the themes work in practice. So the creative footprint is a community engaged census of creative space. 
And the reason we focus on space is because creative space we think of as being fairly precarious. And creative space is also um, uh, absolutely necessary for cultural production to happen. So the way this project works, and shout out to uh, Asha Bazil, recent, recent graduate, um, and I think this is the mayor of Am Stockholm in here somewhere. But the last place we did is Stockholm. We're currently doing it in, in Montreal and Sydney. We've also worked in Tokyo, Berlin, and New York. And we collect, uh, I don't remember exactly how many, but like 25, 30 data points on each venue, where they are, things about their programming, and then we, um, and we, all, we do this in a community process. Um, sorry, I'll forward here for a second. And then we bring these data together. This is a diagram of our data architecture with uh, an R-based data system so that we've coded ourselves where we take data from the census in that country Transportation information about the locations of transformation uh, of, of uh, transportation, and data about political entities, like what are the units of government where there are actionable things that can be done, and we relate them to the venues. So we say, what districts are the most you know have the most expensive rents? What districts have the oldest venues? And what districts are? Um, and then we have all this information about the content. So where, what is the programming that's going on in these places? What is the relationship between programming and rents? What is the relationship between young adults and their co-location with things like transportation, programming, et cetera? And then we also look at the laws, regulations, and guidelines in a broader way and come up with um, some recommendations for, for these cities. Okay, so Tokyo we did in 2018. We were helping them get ready for the 2018, 19. We were helping them get ready for the Olympics, alas. Um, I won't get too deep into what we talked about there, but you see we have all the locations of the venues. We don't show point level data to, because we have informal spaces that are involved here. We don't show anything to real estate developers, anything like that. We try to keep the bond between the community who we're building the data set with um, and the outputs here uh, to be you know, honest about that and protect people. Um, our primary recommendation in Tokyo was that they needed more extended late night train service and we, had, we did set up a pilot for them for the Olympics and it never happened. They were gonna do it, it never happened. Um, this is Stockholm, I think, just getting crushed on the programming variables here. This is a ranking of one to four, one being the lowest category for a venue. This is likelihood of community-focused programming, right? How many community-oriented acts do you have? What is the likelihood that that is your program on a given night? Um, what is the likelihood that your um, promotion promote is about, or sorry, what is the likelihood that you are um, prioritizing creative output versus things like um, food and drink and things like that. Um, what is the likelihood that the, con the content here is experimental and so on. So the community groups assess each place. You know, we have uh, focus groups, tables, people look through each venue, they argue with each other, they put stickers on pieces of paper, right? They tally them up. And then what we're able to do with this information is so each of these is a neighborhood tabulation area in New York. This is a sub-borough sized geography. And we are looking at what is the mean content score in each place. So here you see Midtown Manhattan. Lots and lots of venues. Relatively low rank for content. <coughs> Excuse me, experimental content. You're seeing repeat shows. You're seeing um, Touring shows, you're seeing uh, international acts, um, things like this. Um, out here, you have sort of Bushwick, Ridgewood area. I think, you know, fairly dense cluster. This is like five years ago, so it's probably bigger now. Higher rankings for experimental content. And then if you know New York, you can picture sort of underlying this a pattern of rents. 
right? And so there's like this truism about, oh, there's like this frontier of um, art spaces and artists and hipsters and whatever, like rolling out from NYU over 30, 40 years along the L train, right? And they're bringing with them this, they got their experimental content, they got their informal spaces, right? And they're on the, the, they're on the margin of the rent. And this thing is maybe liminal, right? You'd have to study this time after time. But I mean, this is a truism that we all sort of understood. But it's not until you count every venue that you can, you can see it. It's here. This, I won't ask you to unpack this. This is like, this is a sneak peek, by the way, because we just sent this to Montreal today. This, this is just an example of how we're actually also, this is every single arrondissement in uh, Montreal. And we are looking also at these urban variables. So transit density, population density, percentage of young adults, rent, income, and how many venues and what the venue density is of these places. And we're sort of being able to do individual profiles. I won't ask you to, don't read this, just be like, wow, we've got great data viz. Um, but what we've seen on the whole um, is that there are positive co-location correlations between things like venue density and rents and transit and young adults. Those things are all willing, th those things all want to cluster. Young people are willing to pay to be near venues that are willing to pay to be near transit that are, and the rents are high as a result. And if you have a dollar and you can spend it on rent or you can spend it on programming, that changes where you want to be. And so we see actually a negative correlation between rent and programming. The higher the rent, the less you're investing in programming. And we think of programming our group um, as the bond between the establishment and the patrons, the bond between the establishment and the neighborhood. So you, I mean, I'm not going to use the saying, but there's a saying that basically like, you don't make a mess where you have your dinner, something like this, right? <laughs> so if you have respect for the establishment that you are patronizing, you are not going to cause them problems. And the way that that, that that relationship gets formed is through the food, the music, the hospitality, the advertising, the decor. All those different things are the things that bond you to a place and you, you know, form respect. Um, so we've started to see these global trends. And these might get broken because we're only talking about four or five different cities. Montreal is looking a little different because it's more auto-oriented than, than these cities. But basically, venue density and transit density is pretty strong positive relationship between the two that we've seen. This is kind of like stretched out here. But um, venues need to be, want to be in certain kinds of locations. And that lets us understand more about how we think about cities and how we talk to governments. I think this approach is better than the dominant approach that cities take to trying to measure their nighttime arts and culture. And no, no, no disrespect to the people who do these studies and no disrespect to the people who commission these studies. They're, they have a certain amount of value. But I think that economic impact studies miss something because it's not about the money. If it were about the money, we wouldn't always be having conversations about venues going out of business. If it were about the money, we would actually be decent at measuring this stuff because that's what economists do. They find the things that are important to them and they measure it. Economists are not really measuring the stuff that's going on at night. And if it were about the money, then during COVID, when we couldn't go anywhere, we wouldn't have spent our time complaining about how it just felt shitty to be stuck inside because we didn't feel like people. It's not about the money. It's what makes it good to be a human being. Um, if it were about the money, we would just fill the city with you know, paper mills and condos and call it a wrap, right? It's not about the money. Okay, so I mentioned the pandemic. Everything else that happens here is, is post-pandemic. The pandemic was like a huge 
bomb that went off in our society, but especially in all the businesses that um, required assembly to function. So everybody was really struggling to figure out what to do. I think this is in May of 2020. And I wrote this op-ed to the Inquirer that was just sort of a thought experiment that was like, well, we don't have enough space, but what do we do with all of our time? If you take the same space and you add more time, you get more space, right? Like, I can open a restaurant eight hours a day, or I can open a restaurant for 100 people, or I could open it 16 hours a day for 50 people, right, given the same, or I got that backwards. 50 people for eight hours, 100 people for 16 hours, right? Assuming you have these maximum capacities, which were really governing our world. And it was sort of a thought experiment, but it also pointed to the idea that, like, even if we wanted to do, like, more shift work with our schools and other kinds of things to stretch out our use of the space, we have no framework for doing this in Philadelphia at all. But I wrote this thing, and some people got in touch with me, some old colleagues, and they said, hey, we've been thinking about a lot of the same stuff, and we all need to figure out what to do right now, because this is an extraordinary crisis. And so um, my colleagues from Vibe Lab, my colleague um, Andrena Sejas from Harvard, who's now um, working out of Spain, uh, a couple other folks, we sat down and we thought, well, what do, what, what does the world need from us? How can we be helpful? And um, in the meantime, Vibe Lab had set up a WhatsApp chat, which was like every night mayor, every advocate from a venue organization, every, everybody all over the world. Everybody's trading information like, oh, we tried this thing in, in Lithuania with like street dining and this, and it went like that, but the government here said blah, 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 blah. And um, we thought, oh, we can take this stuff and we can put it through what we know about planning and make a plan. And that's where the Global Nighttime Recovery Plan came from, which is something that I spent about two years of my life working on. Um, and the, the GNRP is a series of practical guides where we didn't say, we have the answer, because like, we don't. And you know, I'm kind of in the forecasting business, but I'm smart enough you know, when it comes to quantitative stuff. But that means that I know that this was all scenario planning. There is no path dependency to what's going on in the early 2020, none at all. So it's all about what are the stories that we can tell, the alternate futures, the different kind of things you could try. Um, so we decided we're not going to do best practices. We're just going to do practices. Just because this thing works in Lithuania, it's not going to work in Lagos. And if this thing works in Vietnam, it doesn't mean it's going to work in Colombia. But let's get everything from everywhere as best we can, and let's try to get all the best people who know what to, how to organize this information and talk about it and see how we can do that. Um, so we released seven chapters built around different themes on a rolling basis. Basically, as fast as we can write them in the descending order of urgency, I think. Um, and it was a pretty awesome effort. So this is from almost a year ago now, so I don't know what this number is. But it was read 1,400 times in 59 countries. We had seven symposia. We had 70 contributors from 22 different countries. Um, and we wrote it in English, Spanish, German, and Japanese. Um, yeah, so this is everywhere where, as of April, people had downloaded the plan. So I'm going to just tell you like the top line on each of the chapters um, and who wrote them. This is uh, Mark Adam Harold, who, um, who's a Brit who's actually a Lithuanian now, and he was, he's the chair of the Vilnius Night, Night Alliance. And first thing we attacked was open air nightlife, which is like, hey, this is something we know about. We're event producers, we have night mayors, we have all these people ne like negotiating between neighbors and noisy things is our MO. We know all about that. <coughs> so this is just an example page from the GNRP. This is like a list of different free gathering strategies. What do you do in a street? What do you do in a park? What do you do on private land? 
what are the advantages of chal or challenges to using each of these types to have an outdoor gathering? What, what is an example of a thing they tried in Berlin where they had different, they analyzed different places for criteria on noise and access? What, they did this thing in Paris, they did this thing in Vilnius. Do you like it? Try it. It's a, it's a menu, right? So you can go to your city government and you can say, I know you're really struggling, but here are some things that would help us. What do you want to order off this menu? Chapter two was about, that was about outside, this is about inside. The Future of Dance Floors, Ricardo Romello uh, from Club Futuro in, in Turin. Um, this, you may have read things about like they turned Berghain, which is a famous club in Berlin, into an art museum for a year. Like this is that. And the people who worked on projects like that were working on you know, this project. Um, chapter three, which I'll dwell on a little more. Innovating for 24-hour cities. I edited this chapter. Worked with Ali and Lenny Schwendinger. Lenny is like um, the foremost, in my mind, thinker about nighttime lighting and design and planning. Um, at one point, uh, this is just a total aside, Ali got stuck in a cable car in the Alps and almost froze to death, and we never finished, we almost didn't finish this thing. But thankfully, he's still with us. Um, he's like, I'm sorry I missed the meeting. Um, I don't know, he was living in France at the time. So, Planning in nighttime. So there's a historic lack of planning around nighttime stuff. But every city is 24 hours. Um, so whether everybody's sleeping, time is still going. Trash is still getting picked up. Things are happening. right? Every city is 24 hours. But this pandemic moment was a very critical moment of experimentation. So as you saw with like eateries, and people were just willing to try stuff which made it a really cool moment to try to roll out all these things that we'd been thinking of for years anyway. So in many ways, the GNRP was about like, a lot of this stuff is actually kind of evergreen and now people are paying attention to what we're into. So, hey, let's present it to you. And for this four-dimensional planning idea, is this still working? Yeah. Plan using time and space. Planning using time and space. How do we make, take advantage of the night to actually solve some of these COVID-related challenges. And um, this was all about activation. There's three themes, activation. What are we doing in, in the spaces, public spaces, sometimes interior? Movement, how are we transporting people through the city? And illumination. And we had case studies here from like Lagos, uh, India, um, Colombia, I think. Very interesting things that people were trying. This I got from Lenny. Um, I think this is really cool. This is like, this is one of the greatest examples of like nighttime thinking to me. This is what Lenny calls shades of night. This is a like proprietary thing of hers that she works with cities on. But basically the idea is there are actually like many different flavors of the nighttime as it progresses from dusk until dawn. Different people doing different things going different places after work activities, after work recreation, night shift workers, et cetera. And that there are different discrete kind of categories of time um, that you can think about. And the way Lenny likes to think about these things is about design and the urban like legibility through the context of light. So we had all these different examples and she gets very detailed about like different types of lighting strands and bulbs that I don't really know anything about. But um, so here's an example from Iran of people bringing their own small lighting solutions out to essentially transform the public spaces at night um, and make them into their own kind of nighttime picnic areas. And then this is something from Bogota that will codified open air activities for um, open air restaurants and stuff like that. Um, but there are all sorts of very cool I ideas that we were able to draw on um, from a wide variety of places where, especially like night markets, and that there's a lot of very interesting stuff that is, um, comes from Asia in this realm. Um, chapter four is about is Tara Duvivier, who's at Pratt Institute. Um, it's about support models for nighttime workers. And the thing about Tara that's super rad is that she has what I call secret ninja skill. So Tara, if you watched the Oscars last year, Tara was DJing the Oscars. 
so she doesn't mess around, but she also knows, so she knows something about something. She knows how the money gets counted at the end of the night in the club. She knows how the transportation works. She knows all these different things, but she's got, for her, her secret ninja skill that she brings to the community is knowing how to be an urban planner and knowing how to think about uh, communities. So this is a slide from that where it's just like trying to like really go through all, who are the nighttime workers. One of our colleagues on this is from South Africa. We had the South African Minister of Art, Sport, and Culture who participated in this, this um, chapter with us and that was really helpful. Um, I'm gonna try to be a little speedier and get to some of the Philly stuff towards the end here. Um, Cosimo Foundation, which is a model that one of our co-authors, uh, Marilyn Poolman, who's the nightmare of groaning in in the Netherlands, brought to this, which is a new sort of patronage relationship that works well with EU tax laws, allowing corporate patrons to pair up with um, artists. And we actually, in the process of doing this, Marilyn thought through this model and started like bailing out music venues um, in 2020, which was pretty cool. Um, two things you could check out if you're interested in nighttime workers. Uh, Night Shift Spital Fields, one of our co-authors on this, uh, J.C. McQuarrie, who's a Romanian um, anthropologist, made a documentary about workers in a flower market in London and what their lives are like. And Alessio Kuliulis um, from University College London, who will show up in a couple slides, um, did this. This is post-GNRP. Um, ideas for basically amenities for 24-hour workers. I forget what the number is, but like over one and a half million Londoners work after 6 p.m. and different kinds of amenities that they need. Um, chapter five is about nighttime governance. Nandor Petrovic and Andrena. And this is where we talked about the concept of night mayors. And this is the night mayor, it might be hard to see in the back, but this is the night mayor as being sort of the central point of contact and cultural translation for all these different, or government translation for all these groups. Go between, between the government and the artists, the night shift workers at a public service organization, the residents and the entrepreneurs, stuff like that. So a lot of this is like a mediating role. <clears throat> and Andrena wrote a great book about this, which uh, is called Managing Cities at Night, that works through a lot of this. Chapter six is from the, the lead licensing barrister in the UK, Philip Colvin. It's about models for nightlife businesses. Chapter seven, which I wrote, and somehow I have a fade in. Um, I didn't do that on purpose. I stole this from an old presentation that Lenny and I gave together. And anyway, thank you, Lenny, for that. Um, this is about data. Um, I don't want to dwell on too much of this, but long story short, nighttime data stink because they are not time sensitive. So if I have some economic data and it just tells me about musicians, I don't really know who's, like, who's what. And actually, there are like numerous, numerous classes of people who are all in the same boat for economic classification. Um, but this was really like a manual of data sources and practices for governments and practitioners and advocates and focuses on time sensitive data and decision making. Um, and it's all open source, so all the examples in the chapter have code vignettes that go with them. Um, and these are just some examples of things from the chapter. You don't have to look at them, they're pretty. This is all the data you could ever think about. It's all listed, here are all the data sources. Um, skip ahead slightly. I will say the GNRP made a, it made a big difference. It was sent to every government department in Amsterdam. It was incorporated into policies in the Berlin Senate, Tokyo, Maastricht, uh, Manchester, Philadelphia, other places. Like it really made a difference. It was a really special project to be a part of. Um, and yeah, so myself and three or four other editors, we worked on all the chapters and I got the chance to write one. A lot of people wrote about it, it was great. Um, I'm gonna skip this next project quickly, but except to tell you that we did a project for Deutsche Gesellschaft for International Zusammenarbeit, which is like 
their version of USAID, sort of, their, um, to figure out how they could work with creative communities in sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. And we did a lot of survey research with communities there during COVID about what spaces they use, where they are, and this is very focused on international development and what the things are that these creative communities needed. And again, we tried to focus on space and economic production. And we saw, saw that there was a lot of co-location between design, fashion, and music. So this is Beirut. And this is like the perfect storm where in Beirut, people were like, the pandemic is like the fourth worst thing in my life right now. It was very upsetting to talk to people about the challenges they were having in their lives. But you may recall there was an enormous explosion in the port in Beirut, which had huge impacts on their most important creative clusters, where we came up with a methodology to try to actually get people to talk about places. You know, no two people will call a neighborhood the same thing. We got, for all these different cities, we tried to actually really nail this down. Um, and this was combined with the fact that you can't rebuild it because there's runaway inflation. But we were able to really pin this down in, in Lebanon. And this is a slide from Iraq about different things that people need technologically to work with their, um, to work there. So big thing in Iraq, for example, social acceptance in the arts. Not so much of this in, in Lebanon. Um, but they're like, inflation's a big deal. So the la I know I'm a little over time. The last thing I'll mention is what's going on in Philadelphia right now. Um, so in 2020, I was asked by um, Council Member Isaiah Thomas and Catherine Gilmore Richardson to join Philadelphia City Council's Arts and Culture Task Force. And the idea here was to get artists off, you know, off the floor during the pandemic. People could not perform. People could not make art. And one of the things that um, myself and a couple other people stated at the beginning of this process was that we needed to talk about nighttime in Philadelphia because that was, the, that was the place where cultural production happened and there was no framework for dealing with it. But like, hey, by the way, I'm like writing seven global plans. Like we have some things you could read, like check, check this out. This is preparation meeting opportunity. Like this is where I actually got my chance to really make something happen. Um, so we did a lot of data research. This is the pandemic and this is amusement tax projections that I made and it goes to like zero. Um, and then, you know, had some, some recovery in 2021, which is good. But I mean, we did a lot of analysis of different metrics to really show it was as bad as we thought it was and maybe worse. And you remember this, this is the 24 hour Philadelphia survey. Well, this is where we were able to say, we actually know who we, we are artists asked to be on the task force. We know who we are and what we want because we put a word on it. So we say, these are the biggest problems. These are our values. These are actually inclusivity, safety, and creativity. These are the three founding values of the Philadelphia Nighttime Economy Director's Office. They come from the people. Um, so we were able to put this stuff into practice um, through policy. This is what we recommended, and some of this we've done. So we give two million. We recommended and gave two million dollars in direct support to small artists, grants of one to five thousand dollars. It's called the Illuminate the Arts grants, and we proposed uh, the creation of a nighttime economy office which now exists in the Commerce Department uh, that was budgeted for by City Council in 2021. We recommended things in harm reduction, zoning and licensing reforms, want to lower the barrier to entry for entrepreneurs to promote equity, um, health and economic support for nighttime workers, financial support for businesses, the federal government did a lot of that, agent of change laws, which is a very interesting zoning related concept that essentially prevents disruption against uh, noise polluting kind of entertainment businesses. Um, or I shouldn't say that, not noise polluting necessarily, but preserves their autonomy so you can't build an apartment next to a nightclub and say 311 complaining out of business. 
lighting and design. And then we also talked about using Philly 2026 as, as, and the World Cup as maybe like a launch pad for some good ideas. And we got out in the public and we talked about it. We wrote op-eds. We really tried to push in public. And a lot of this ended up getting on the agenda, which is great. And I think a lot of these things are, are in the offing. This is a lot of what we talked about in response to South Street and stuff like that. So we proposed the office. It contained a lot of the best ideas we thought we had. And people were accepted, uh, accepting of it because there was a moment of crisis. And Rahim is on a citywide listening tour right now. Um, I'll tell you briefly what, what Rahim is up to and what he does, and then I, I think that'll be it for the presentation for tonight. So Rahim, the night mayor of Philadelphia, for those of you who have heard of this but you're not really familiar, is in the Department of Commerce. Um, and he facilitates government services for nighttime businesses across departments. And he's engaging stakeholders outside the government and inside. So he's meeting with workers, business improvement districts, entrepreneurs, um, and then he's meeting with like transit, l and I, et cetera. So when someone has a problem on the inside or the outside, he can put people together, and then there's not just as much like grumbling and uh, dysfunction. And a lot of this is about facilitating dialogue and working with like overlo overlooked groups like uh, nightlife workers, businesses, et cetera. And hopefully he'll be there to provide you know input on planning and licensing issues right now. Uh, he's doing um, a citywide listening tour that started at World Cafe Live and laying the groundwork for a planning process and the stakeholder networks. So, okay, we've reached the present day. That's the end of the timeline. So the future is we have a couple of cool new projects we're doing at Penn Praxis. We're doing a big study of independent music venues for Nashville Metro. We're doing the creative footprint in Montreal. And um, I'm working with Rahim on Commerce Department's um, advisory board for the, for the nightmare. Um, the last thing I want to say, and that was a lot. I wasn't sure how long it would take. I'm a little longer than I wanted. Uh, none of this work is mine alone, OK? I may have led some of the projects. I may have catalyzed some of the projects. I didn't do any of them by myself. So some of you are on this list. Thank you, and all these other people played really important roles in one thing or another along the way. And maybe that's the most important part, is that like, this is all community-oriented stuff, and if there's something that you take from this if you're a planning student, it's really that, you know, take your secret ninja skills, find the community that you know about, and build a team. And cool things can happen. Thank you. Do you have any questions about anything? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm very curious about the informal spaces, uh, informal venues, mostly because I like to go to them. Mm -hmm. um, When you talk about things like safety and like fire violations, that comes with like officialness in my head. And there's some like there's some things that informal venues can't do. And yep. how much of your like research and exposing of these issues do you think might actually hurt informal venues? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, Okay, so I'd say like for example, like a West Philly house show, that would count by our tally in, in creative footprint. Like we sort of have a bar about number of events. Um, like if you just do a one-off thing in one place one time, I don't think it really counts. 
for our metric. Like we have a cutoff. I think it's like one event a month or something like that. But like um, your second question was about like how do we find them? Yeah. I wouldn't be doing this if people didn't, if you meet people in Philadelphia who know me, they're not gonna know me from in here. They're gonna know me from out there. And everybody that we work with, that's kind of who we are. So um, some of it is trust, some of it is just like being, I hate the way of saying this, but like being in the scene, right? Because you meet whoever it is you know from whatever city and they're like, okay, I got you. There is bias that comes into this because there, the New York data, I was not happy with certain aspects of it because I knew what the limitations were of being who we were and what, what was not being touched by our outreach. With regards to the safety stuff, um, I mean, I think no matter who you are, the only good, safe li the only good nightlife is safe nightlife, right? And there's a lot of stuff that 24-hour Philadelphia, for example, there are plenty of people who do all sorts of things in informal spaces, some of which you might even know about, but they really care about wanting to make things safe. They just don't necessarily have the money to go legit. And that's an interesting category of interaction because that's like you're getting into things like, I don't know if you know what Dance Safe is. It's like a, like a drug testing nonprofit kind of thing. And for example, they'll show up at a festival and try to test drugs so people don't die of fentanyl overdoses, but then there's also this tacit understanding that like there's something illegal going on. So like that's a, that's a gray area for everybody. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, this, this Nashville project is kind of all about that. So they, they are having big problems with venues going out of business. And we're thinking about how a historic preservation framework works with this. Um, there are people who do this stuff with historic music studios and stuff like that in Detroit. We just recently had a thing in Philadelphia to save Sigma Sound Studios, which is where the Philadelphia Sound was kind of developed at 12th and Arch. But I mean, Commercial rent stabilization is something that people talk about in various places as being a way to maybe deal with this. Um, yeah, I, I have weird thoughts about like, is there a natural life cycle for a creative venue? Like CBGB's went out of business. Was CBGB's culturally important or was it a museum to the, was it a nostalgic museum to an important musical period in people's lives in New York? That's a hypothetical, I'm not saying that to be provocative, but like what does it mean for CBGBs to go away? Does that mean that like something inside you dies or does it mean that, that something important is lost because there's no music continuing there? I don't know. I'm thinking about like the Eaton Battle reopening of the jazz at the club. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like maybe the location is more important than the club. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, was something else before it was right. Sean Agnew's boot and saddle, so yeah. Yeah. To trying to plan to protect creative spaces? Or like the projects you've been working on. Like what was your biggest challenge? Oh. Done? The biggest challenge is that I think people in creative industries are very, I don't want to say resistant to getting organized, but like it's, um, w when you're not really being getting a lot out of it economically, and it's also like a notoriously flaky kind of community in, in a number of ways, it's a little hard to be like, let's get political, right? That can be a little tough. But it, um, yeah, that part, that part is challenging. I think one of the other things that's, that I've found really challenging is that I think the pandemic exposed a lot of really broken things, some of which we were able to, take action on in various places and some of 
which people just went back to ignoring. When the pandemic was over, I think um, mental health in nighttime communities is an enormous, enormous problem. A lot of self-medicating, a lot of abusive relationships, you know, um, on the back, back of the house and people treat each other poorly, a lot of economic precarity. And I don't think that really got addressed in a major way. And that really disappointed me. Yes. Um. On the topic of like informality, um, two things that you're talking about are governance and data science. And mm -hmm. when I think about best like standard practices of governance and standard practices of data science, ne neither one of them can kind of encompass informality, gray areas. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, for both governance and data science, like what what really excites you in those arenas around yeah. informality? Informality, interesting. I mean, I, I will agree with you that like governance and informality seems like a little bit of a clash. But I would say that there are some kind of renegade elements to data science, or at least the way we try to do it. And in part, like this survey here, this survey here was really about taking a lot of informal things and putting them into a format that formal people can engage with, which I think data is really good for that. I mean, you know, for good and for ill, you can, you can tell truths with data, you can lie with data, but it really puts a veneer of professional, like uh, professionality on this. Um, I think there are also some very renegade data related things going on in Berlin. There's a thing called Club Kataster. Um, they have a concept there called Club Stürben, which is like club death. And Club Kataster is, um, essentially a geospatial overlay of development pressure and spaces, formal and informal. And also they use some of those methodologies to do spatial analysis to identify open air candidates, places along a number of criteria to have informal open air events in all the parks in Berlin through the, um, through the pandemic. So, I mean, in, in some ways it's like a little bit of a, uh, we take a little bit of a civic hacking approach approach. I've done some workshops at like like music festivals about this stuff and I don't know. I try to dress I try to dress it down a little bit if I can. <laughs> yes. Um, when you're trying to assess like the energy and the vitality of um, a nighttime economy specifically around the arts, did you find that there were um, particular things that were difficult to quantify and some things that you really just needed to experience and that were more qualitative? Yeah, totally. I mean, a lot of this stuff is really elusive. I also think a lot of the, there's a lot of bias in, in trying to evaluate content. Like, I mean, I've been a DJ for 20 years. I can tell you there's no good music and bad music. There's just taste, right? And so like, are people like acting out their tastes or their like community biases against certain kind of artistic content. Like we try to make it kind of objective. You can say like, is this, is this local or not? Is like, I think you can say, is, are we marketing food or are we marketing music in this, or drinks really, or are we marketing music? But um, yeah, I mean, some of it really does defy description. That's why you, you kind of have to be a fairly charismatic kind of translator about like what it is about the soul that makes this stuff important because otherwise who cares right and let's do like one more yeah yes Mm -hmm. And they had like a large scale announcement of how this was a safe space and all those things. And so I was wondering like if any kind of, if your research ever involved or kind of came across this idea of like perceived safety yeah. um, versus like actual safety that you keep a night life going. Yeah, well I mean, didn't, 
never explicit comparisons of perceived versus actual safety. Well, I don't know. Actually, I have a backup slide for this. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that op-ed about uh, that I about that I showed in the nightmare part. That was the the nightmare had been hired, he was not on the job, the shooting happened on South Street. We, as the Arts and Culture Task Force, got somewhat frustrated with what we saw as being like governmental experimentation to like make this problem go away. A lot of business owners that we knew down there weren't happy, the business improvement district, no one was happy. <coughs> so this is uh, firearm incidents between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. in Philadelphia from 2017 until present. So as you can see, the trend is generally upward. These are over 200 feet away from a licensed establishment, which keep in mind most of them are only open till 2 a.m. The pattern near a licensed establishment <coughs> is less severe and it's still quite low and the proportion keeps relatively well over time. You are still substantially safer near the premises of a licensed establishment that has trained security, eyes on the street, cameras, and lighting, than you are in these other situations where you may be in commercial corridors, domestic situations, I don't know what, I'm not a criminologist. This is actual. Perceived is very different, okay? And the perception is actually maybe the most important thing to tackle. Um, so the way to get at dealing with the perception is we came up with a number of different things. Um, one was through trying to program the street. And we didn't say, here's some idea we made up. They had a shooting on 6th Street in Austin, Texas some years ago, and they have a nighttime economy manager, Brian Block, very sharp guy. Great ideas that came through their city council. So we said, what about that? Um, or different things they've done in Orlando, Florida with circulation and design why don't you put the art you want in the street? Why don't you use temporary occupancy licenses to program some of the vacant storefronts in a, a co working with the owners? Messaging campaigns, harm reduction safety ambassadors, um, certification programs for harm reduction best practices that people can, like, there are a range of things that we put in front of them, like, these are ways to communicate to people that their relationship with these places can be positive or that they feel safe or they know something is a specific way inside when they enter because they're aware of a like set of standards. Um, so yeah, the, but yeah, the perception is like the whole thing. Um, I, th I think we should hold it there at 7.30, um, but I'm happy to like, I'm happy to mingle for a while and I really wanna thank you all for coming and I could talk about this stuff Forever. Like I said, I'll be here at 10.15 tomorrow morning, so if we go till then, that's fine. Thanks so much.